Hey everybody, happy March. It's a kind of a blustery day here in, in Chicago, but I still felt like I needed to be outside to talk to you about um, bees and natives and flowers. So I wish it was nicer out so I could walk around the garden with you and actually show you what I'm gonna talk about today, but um, we're not quite there yet. So I'm gonna actually feature as I talk about some of these plants that I want to talk to you about. I'm going to feature some of the art from my book. Right here. Um, Be Native Flower Power. I have all the art in the book. And it's on Amazon if you want more information. But enough about plugging my book. Let's talk about shade plants and let's talk about natives because it's really great to use natives in tough spots. When I do a lot of my book signings, that is the constant question I get. I have a really tough shade area or I have a spot under a tree or under a bush and I can't grow anything. Like nothing grows there. What can I do? And first of all, native plants are super forgiving um, because they naturally grow and have grown and evolved uh, in the area that you live. So they are attuned to the climate, they're attuned to the soil, they're attuned to that ecosystem. And they also have evolved with the, the food web and the biodiversity within that area, and especially bees and butterflies within that area. There is a symbiotic relationship between the two. So that is why a native plant is four times more likely to be pollinated by a bee than a non-native. Sidebar fact for you next time you play Trivial Pursuit. Um, so there's definitely some favorites of mine for the shade area that I want to share with you because I know those are tough spots for everybody, for every gardener. Um, so without further ado, let's talk about those. Um, I'm going to kind of go through them from a size perspective because that's kind of how well, I know that's how I garden. That's how I design my gardens. Um, you know, understanding what's shorter, what's more medium height to kind of fill, fill areas and fill kind of a middle space in, in, a, in a bed, and then what's tall in case you need something like in the back of a border or to fill a corner um, nicely. So my first favorite is called Wild Ginger, and you can see by uh, the way it looks, it's really cool looking. It almost looks like it's from like the prehistoric era. Um, it's only about four inches high. It's a lot of time used for ground cover. And each plant only produces one flower, but it's a very important flower because it allows for a lot of beetles along the ground to uh, pollinate it. It gives important nectar there. So wild ginger will grow in deep shade, can also grow in part shade. It does like moisture. It is a native to woodland habitats. So think about that as you think about spots in your garden that it would like. It's very forgiving. Um, and once the flower is done, you have really wonderful bright green leaves as a ground cover to fill an area. So it's very versatile. It's very tolerant of spaces and um, it's a really, really cool plant. So that's one of my first favorites for, for deeper shade. Okay, my next favorite, now we're gonna go to the kind of the, the medium height. So my next favorite is called White Wood Aster, and it is a power pollinator. It pollinates bees, it pollinates, pollinates butterflies, it's a host plant to butterflies. It also, it, it likes all kinds of beetles. Um, when you look at the pollinator, kind of, uh, kind of the breadth of what pollinators could be, it's not just bees and butterflies, there's fireflies, there's beetles, um, hoverflies, moths are actually a major contributor to the pollinator um, ecosystem. So don't just think bees and butterflies, a lot of these natives do a lot more than that. So white wood aster, is filled with these beautiful, tiny, white, starry flowers, full clusters, uh, fragrant smelling, and um, really, really tolerant of drought, 
So especially like shady under a tree where you're not gonna get a lot of moisture and rain because the tree is taking it all, these white wood asters do great under there. And you, they actually have a lot of flower power throughout the season. So you've got some flowers in a shade area where usually you can't really keep flowers that long, um, which is great. Now, the one thing about white wood aster for native purists is it's very specific, specific to certain states and areas. Um, so if you want to stay really hyper-focused on, oh, it's only native in certain areas, because of course, once natives start naturalizing in other places, sometimes they can sadly become an invasive versus just being aggressive. So you gotta be careful about that. Um, but if you want to look at another kind of shade loving aster, it's not a, it doesn't like total deep shade. See, white wood aster can handle deeper shade. Um, but there's another aster that has a wider footprint and it's called um, blue wood aster. And it prefers um, part shade, so it needs a little bit of sun, but it has a wider footprint. So you can look at those two um, for our shadier areas of our, um, of our gardens and they are both power pollinators. And um, the, white, the great thing about the white wood aster too is that it, um, it blooms a little earlier than some of the other asters. A lot of the asters bloom way late in the season, which is also important for our monarchs. Um, anyway, so as you can see, it's lovely, it's white, it's beautiful. Um, so definitely take a look at it for um, your tough shade areas. <clears throat> Okay, a third favorite of mine, which is again, medium height, so we're talking about 10 to 18 inches, um, is the fringed bleeding heart. So some of you more conventional gardeners probably have bleeding heart in your gardens. I do, I love bleeding heart. But here's the thing about bleeding hearts, they don't last that long. They come in early spring and then they die off and that's it, you're done. But actually, that is a cultivar from the fringed bleeding heart, also known as like a wild bleeding heart. And the nice thing about the fringed bleeding heart is that the, um, the leaves are almost like fern-like, so they add a lot of nice texture to your shade garden. But here's the other great thing about fringed bleeding heart. You have these beautiful heart-shaped blooms, as you can see, you know, in pinks and blues and lavenders. Um, but they are, they are also a power pollinator, host plant some butterflies, and the blooms last longer than the cultivar bleeding heart. They're gonna last a lot longer. So you got that added color in a shade garden that again, it's really hard to get color in your shade garden for a long time. Um, so a lot of times, you know, our, our shade gardens are based on texture and different shades of green. Um, and that's the great thing about this particular native because you have both. You have that really nice fringed leafy texture, but you also have that color too. Um, and most importantly, you're helping the pollinators. So that's key. That's another really great option for a mid-height, um, deeper shade option. And finally, kind of one of our taller favorites is false Solomon seal. Now, some of you conventional gardeners out there probably are doing Solomon seal. I have Solomon seal, love Solomon seal. Um, and it's, it's also a great option but um, false Solomon seal has uh, more dramatic plumes of white clusters, as you can see. Um, and they are, uh, they help the smaller bee pollinators as well as a lot of beetles. Um, and it's a nice, it's very um, drought tolerant. And it gives you that poof of color in a more, in a taller plant, which is nice. So I know for me, I have a really tough area where there's this big bush in a, sh in a corner shade, um, shade bed up front. And I'm planning to put some of that in there because I'm tired of the ferns and I know not a lot of water gets back there. So I'm gonna try um, some false Solomon seal as well as some foam flower, which technically isn't native for uh, Illinois, but um, it's, it's um, and I wasn't gonna talk about foam flower, but um, that's another one that I'm hoping to get in there. So there's definitely, you know, when you really look at it, 
When you look at it, natives are a really great option for those tough gardening areas, especially for shade. There's a lot of woodland ephemerals, woodland natives that are just naturally uh, able to handle those tough situations because that's what they do. That's what they do out in nature. So why not bring that into your yard, into your garden? You bring that, um, that flexibility, that versatility, that toughness. And not only that, you're bringing biodiversity into your garden, which is so, so important right now. So um, I've got a, a sum up after I say goodbye to you, or you can do a screen grab of the list and you've got the list with you on your phone. Next time you go to the garden center, you have some options on those tough garden spots in the shade. Anyway, thanks for joining me on Flora and the Bees. This is gonna be a kind of a new little mini series because this has become a really big passion of mine. Um, and I'm going to share kind of most asked questions, answers, um, thoughts on just getting our pollinators back to the levels that they need to be and, and native flowers. So without pollinators, guys, we don't have much of anything. We don't have food. We don't have green trees. We don't have farmland. We don't have anything. They, they are key to the whole ecosystem. So, you know, join me in even planting just a few natives and you're going to see kind of some amazing things happen in your garden. I promise you. Anyway, thanks for joining me. Have a great weekend and spring is only like 19 days away. So it's going to happen. Bye guys. Bye.